morning and greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning's worship. Uh, we have, as usual, a few announcements to bring to your attention. A joyful one, the uh, arrival of baby Samuel Lemley Thorwart uh, this week. Ba Mom and baby are doing well. We'll thank, thank the Lord for his uh, faithfulness and his kindness to them and continue to ask you to pray for them as they now address this new little one in their home. Uh, Pastor Carl this morning is in Charlotte for the baptism of his eighth grandchild, uh, Isla Faith Holmes at uh, Christ Covenant PCA. So you want to be praying for Pastor Carl as they travel and enjoy that uh, time of celebration. Uh, we have our usual activities this week. You can always re recommend that you look at your bulletin for the upcoming events. We have Men at the Gates, prayer meetings, etc. Wednesday night we'll have our King's Kids Singing School. Of course, the 545 dinner, adult Bible study. Uh, and also uh, youth and uh, catechids. Uh, this Wednesday we're going to hear from David and Vicki Shellcross and their recent trip to, to uh, Africa. Uh, so that's going to be something we'll be really uh, looking forward to Do we hear about what the Lord had done through their time uh, there. Uh, again, this morning we'll have our J-terms. Uh, this is the last week of the J-term classes. And again, if you would uh, like to go into the, there's a class on conflicts and marriage in the choir room. Pastor Anderson is teaching. I'll be uh, teaching the final class on heaven here in the sanctuary. Uh, you have your choice of which of those you go to. And, of course, uh, the, the children's uh, classes as they have been the last couple of weeks. I uh, also want to remind you of some upcoming things. We have the Mommy and Me, or as I like to say, our Mums and Tots on January 30th. Ladies' Bible study is going to be beginning in February. Men, you'll want to note as well, Ridge Haven for the fathers and sons will be February 23rd to 25th. So make sure you block that out on your calendar, and we'll be uh, asking you to sign up soon. By the way, our uh, past intern, Steve Richmond, will be teaching, so I'm really looking forward to seeing him and enjoying a time of fellowship with him there. If you're visiting with us, uh, we ask you to fill out one of those blue cards in the pew rack in front of you. Just let us know that you're here. You can hand it to us afterwards so we can greet you personally or just put it in the offering plate, and we'll just send you a note of greeting and uh, open up the door for conversation should you like to have, uh, if you'd like to have some questions answered or more information about the church. <clears throat> This morning, we're going to consider another of the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. Of course, our faithfulness is dependent on the only one who is perfectly faithful, God himself. But is God's faithfulness important? Listen to what some of the reformers say. John Bunyan, God's faithfulness is a great comfort to us when we are in distress. John Owen, God's faithfulness is the foundation of our hope. William Gurnall, God's faithfulness is the anchor of our souls. Thomas Manton, God's faithfulness is the source of our strength. Richard Sibbs, God's faithfulness is the reason for our joy. John Flavel, God's faithfulness is the basis of our trust. John Calvin, God's faithfulness is the assurance of our salvation. Jonathan Edwards, God's faithfulness is the guarantee of our eternal life. It is for these, of course, many other reasons that we come this morning to worship our God. So prepare your hearts now. We'll be called to worship in just a moment.
Lord calls us to worship this morning from Psalm 66, verse 8. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Well, let's do that very thing right now by standing and singing hymn number 166, You Who His Temple Throng, hymn 166. Yes, you remain standing as we confess our faith that's printed in the, uh, con uh, the bulletin from the Confession of Faith, both from the Confession as well as the larger catechism. I'll ask questions for each one. Uh, both of them have to do and uh, bring up the topic of, again, faithfulness, which you will again consider later this morning. Brothers and sisters, what is a vow? What do we pray for in the third petition? you remain standing as we honor the reading of God's holy and infallible word. The Old Testament reading from Psalm 89. And note again the faithfulness of God as uh, presented in this psalm. Hear now the word of God. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I've made a covenant with my chosen, and I've sworn to my servant David. 
Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints and to be held in reverence by those around, all those around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Acts 6 is a great text that illustrates some of the unique features of the church. For example, we read in uh, Acts, uh, in various places in Acts, uh, particularly Acts 2 in this case, who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Here we see the demarcation between those of the world and those who profess to be believers in Christ. In verse 42 we read, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The people who joined the church sat together under the teaching and the authority of the apostles for instruction and for prayer. We read of the special unity among believers in verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord of the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. In verse 47, we learn of the members of the church praising God and having favor with all the people. Then God blessed them, and we read, he added to the church daily those who were being saved. Demarcation from the world, mutual service and ministry, <coughs> excuse me, sitting under the preaching of the word, fellowship, communion, and prayer are all part of joining a local body of believers. This morning, we have the great joy of introducing our newest members to you. I'd like to invite Emily Scott, along with Blesson and Manju Varghese, to come forward. I'll just like stand right over here. <clears throat> Along with their shepherding elders, Ron Hoyle and Scotty Anderson. If you're not familiar with our shepherding model here at Woodruff Road, every family has a shepherding elder who prays for them, visits them, encourages them, and provides spiritual counsel. Emily Blisson and Manju have already met with the session. We've had the joy of hearing how God worked in each of their lives to draw them to Christ. And I hope you also make time to hear their testimonies as well when you sit down with them at a dinner on Wednesday or perhaps you have them to your homes. For these reasons and in response to the biblical pattern and teaching in membership, we welcome these new members into our fellowship this morning. So let me ask each of you then to respond to the following questions with I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? I do. do you resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have brought these folks here this morning. What a joy it is to see Bless Anamanju and Emily uh, per, uh, giving their vows to join us and to be part of this local body. We pray, Father, your blessing upon them as they minister here. We also pray that we would be a blessing to them, that the relationship would be one of mutual edification, encouragement, growth in Christ. Uh, all these we pray would bring glory to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. It should come as no surprise that the <clears throat> fruit of the spirit of faithfulness necessarily connects to our giving. When you join the church and made a vow to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, you committed to faithfully give to the church out of that with which the Lord has blessed you. But your faithfulness should not be seen as a burden. 
It should be seen rather as an outworking of the grace of God for which uh, you thank him. Let us pray. Our Lord, we do thank you that in your faithfulness to us, you covenant to make us like you, faithful. To that end, we ask that you continue in that work through your spirit in our hearts to joyfully and faithfully give to your kingdom work, for we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Please join with me as we lift our prayers up to the Lord. We humbly and reverently approach your heavenly Father Father, by the help of the Holy Spirit and through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come humbly, for we are sinful people with unclean lips and darkened hearts. We are unworthy to approach and address you, except by your great mercy and kindness shown forth to us as a father shows to his disobedient children whom he loves and pities. You, O Lord, are the exalted Most High One, the one and only true and living God, transcendent and majestic and righteous above all. You are the triune God, infinite and eternal, the creator and sustainer of all creation, both in the heavens and in the earth. There is none like you. You are glorious and almighty all-knowing and all-wise, long-suffering and most gracious and merciful. Your mighty works have revealed your glory through the generations of your children. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. 
Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We praise you with human hearts and lips, which are defiled by our sins in thought, word, and deed. When we look toward the throne, to our King and our Lord, we must cry out, Woe unto us, we are undone. We are deserving of nothing but your wrath and condemnation. We can do no good of ourselves. All of our actions are self-serving and mean. Our evil words and deeds are open for all to see, but only you can see the intents of our heart and its blackness and filth. All of our main thoughts are ever before you. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Against you and you only have we sinned and done evil in your sight, that you may be found perfectly just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Wash us with the blood of Christ and we shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from our sins and blot out our iniquities. Create in us clean hearts. O oh God, renew steadfast spirits within us. We give you thanks for the rich blessings to us individually, to our families, and to this body of Christ, for the blessing of our adoption into your covenant family, for the assembly of the saints coming together in prayer and worship and to be fed your word, for the fellowship of the saints, for encouragement and care. We give thanks for the life and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our prophet, priest, and king, our redeemer, who paid the full penalty for our sins that we might have peace with you and eternal life in heaven. We give thanks for the blessing of the Holy Spirit who changed our hearts to receive your truth and the gospel of Jesus and continually teaches us and guides our daily walk that we might put off our sinful ways and abide with Christ. Well, the true blessing to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ on each Sabbath day morning and evening, to rest from the strifes and struggles of the world, to be fed and nourished by the word preached and taught, coming together singing your praises and lifting our prayers to you. It is our blessed place where we can rest and refresh and recharge our souls for our daily living. Help us, O Lord, to hunger and thirst for your word, for the nourishment and strengthening of our faith in Christ our Lord, that it would be used for doctrine, reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness that each of us will be made more complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work we pray for the expansion of your kingdom throughout the earth that your word and the gospel would be spread to every people in every tongue that your kingdom would come and that thy will would be done on earth as it is in heaven for the missionaries sent throughout the world we lift our prayers for your chosen men preaching word in various nations around the globe, that you would gird them up with boldness and power and perseverance, that you would give them all the necessary provision as they labor in the field, and that your spirit would make their preaching both powerful and effective to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that have not yet heard or have not yet believed. Lord, we are thankful for the blessing of the fruitful, fruitfulness of our families at Woodruff Road and the continual blessing of children being added to the covenant family. We are thankful for the new babies born, healthy and strong. And we pray for our ladies still bearing children in preparation for birth, asking for strength and good health for the mothers and the babies. We pray for the parents at Woodruff Road as they nurture and train their children, that they would be diligent to teach the full doctrines of our faith, and that the children would be drawn to Christ in their early years, to saving faith in Christ that they would never know a day when they did not call upon the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We pray for the afflicted, infirm, and those struggling among us, both those in this flock and also for family members and friends. First and foremost, we pray for salvation in Christ that for any that are not yet saved, that you would be merciful and gracious even to the last day to draw them to yourself. We pray for your mercy and gentleness, for relief from pain and for healing. We pray that you would strengthen and encourage, that you would give them peace, comfort, and trust, 
knowing that they are in your loving arms. Now, as we prepare for the preaching of your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would draw our full attention to the word preached. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see that the Spirit would anoint our preacher's lips, that it would be preached with boldness and power and accuracy and clarity, that your people would be drawn near to Christ and be strengthened in their faith. We lift these prayers up to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ask you to once again stand out of the reading of God's word from the New Testament. Our New Testament reading is Galatians 5, 22 to 23, a short passage, listing the fruit of the Spirit. Once again, hear the word of God. <clears throat> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in preparation for the preaching of the word, let us sing together Psalm 1b. How bless the man, Psalm 1b. I was seven years old when my dad called myself and my siblings together to make an announcement that he was no longer going to be living with us. Of course, I did not fully understand that at the time. Uh, that sunk in more later on as I got older. But uh, years later, I came across a poem that my mom had read, or that my mom had written regarding that time, and I don't remember the poem, I've lost it since, but I do remember these particular words in the poem. She wrote, there's someone else, he calmly said, and love that would not die was dead. Unfaithfulness in a marriage or a family or friendship is devastating. And in our time, it's so commonplace, it's no longer looked at as shocking or newsworthy. Along with other ramifications of turning away from God we see in the West, there comes the heavy cloud of mistrust, inability to put your confidence in others who are ready to compromise their integrity and their reputation for a moment's pleasure or for a slight advantage. I would venture to guess that just about everyone, <coughs> excuse me, everyone here has experienced unfaithfulness, witnessed it, or even been a party to it. Many of you know the awful sense of betrayal 
or have seen up close the devastation done to families, to businesses, friendships, because someone decided to break a vow or to con or contract or trust. But what does the Bible have to say about faithfulness? Well, it says a lot, more than we can ever cover in one sermon, but I will leave that up to you to chase down further verses uh, if you would like to do that. Before we do, let's ask the Lord's help as we look at this incredibly important and practical subject. Father, we thank you that you are the faithful one, that you've given us the picture of what faithfulness looks like. Forgive us for not thinking and dwelling on that reality and the implications of it. But we pray now that your spirit would help us to appreciate this fruit of the spirit as a reflection of your very character and attributes. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our context is Galatians 5. The letter to the Galatians was written by Paul to the churches of Galatia. It's a mini version of the book of Romans, and we have seen it's packed with theological riches and truths that are fundamental to understanding the Christian faith. <clears throat> Primary in Paul's mind is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Contrary to all other worldviews that teach your good must outweigh your bad if you want to and any hope of a happy afterlife, Christianity teaches that you can never, never expunge your record of wrongdoings, nor can you ever do enough good deeds to eradicate the bad or to earn some kind of pass into heaven. Paul's point that we can never hear enough is that heaven is only attainable if the payment for your sins is done by someone else on your behalf. And the righteous deeds needed to warrant an eternity with God must be done perfectly by someone other than yourself. And of course, that's the whole good news, isn't it? The Lord Jesus has done that very thing, taken the wrath of God upon himself and has lived that perfect life in our place. And those who put their trust in him have him there for as their substitute. But the Bible also teaches that following one's conversion, one's acceptance of the gift of life, we are also given the gift of the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts. And when the Holy Spirit enters our hearts, they, there are inevitable effects that the, word God, that the Word of God does on our minds, our wills, and our emotions. We call it the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the presence of God's Spirit in us, as we continue to walk in faith and grow in obedience and in our relationship with him. We've been through each of the fruit of the spirit now in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Uh, we've been there for a while now. We are on the seventh of these. We have two more to go, Lord willing. <clears throat> this is the fruit of faithfulness. What is faithfulness? The Greek word is the same word that is translated faith. And so you must have to look at the context to know how to translate the word either as faith or faithfulness. In Galatians 5.22, the word is translated by almost every translation as faithfulness. It fits in with the context of the other words there. A couple do translate it as faith, but those are, um, they're not, not very many. Well, what is faithfulness? The Greek word comes from a root which means persuaded, to be persuaded or to come to trust. And we begin to see the richness of the word, both for what it says about the individual, but also what it means to those who are around an individual, one who is faithful is one who can be trusted. In the context here in Galatians, we want to consider the nuanced distinction then between faith and faithfulness. We're, we're talking about faithfulness here. I think in our own minds, we kind of sense there's a difference between faith and faithfulness, despite the fact that they come from the same Greek word. While faith refers to the, the presence of a persuasion and belief, as in he or she has faith, Faithfulness suggests an active faith, a perpetual, abiding faith that has implications both for the ones who have this fruit and, as I said, for those who rely upon them. Let me give a description of faithfulness for kind of our working description for this morning. The fruit of the spirit of faithfulness is the settled persuasion of the truths of God leading to consistency in godly words and deeds and resulting in trustworthiness. If you're taking notes, I'll say it again slowly. The fruit of the spirit of faithfulness is the settled persuasion of the truths of God leading to consistency 
in godly words and deeds and resulting in trustworthiness. <clears throat> of course, to understand faithfulness, we have to start, uh, as we have with every one of the other fruit of the Spirit, we have to turn to uh, the very source of faithfulness, the example, the paradigm of faithfulness, the very one in whom faithfulness is an attribute, the one who cannot not be faithful because it's essential to who he is. And of course, that is God himself. It probably goes without saying that faithfulness is affirmed over and over. God's faithfulness is affirmed over and over in scripture. Just one example, Psalm 36, 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. There's also an interesting connection in the Hebrew word for faithfulness, which is also often translated truth. We see the connection between these two. For example, in Deuteronomy 32, 4, we read that God is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth, sometimes translated faithfulness, truth, faithfulness. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. The Hebrew word here is translated truth or faithfulness in multiple translations. It goes both ways. So we see that connection. But why would one word be translated as truth or faithfulness? Because the two are connected to each other. For example, we read in Titus 1, verse 2, that God cannot lie. When God speaks, he always speaks the truth. And thus, his words are trustworthy. They're reliable. When God promises or covenants to do something, his words are true. He is faithful. You can trust him to fulfill his promises. In fact, even when we are not faithful, we'll tar- we'll tar- we are told that he remains faithful to us. 2 Timothy 2.13. We see multiple examples in Scripture. In fact, each covenant God makes with the people, the Edemic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New covenant are all fulfilled and being fulfilled by him because he's faithful to fulfill his covenants, what he promises. Genesis 9.14-16. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud. I will look on to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. We read in Exodus 2, 24 to 25. God heard, this is when the people are in Egypt and they're groaning. And it says, God heard their groaning. and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. In Leviticus 26, 42, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and co- my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember. Psalm 106, 45, and for their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercies. Don't let that, don't let the, don't let that word remember make you think that perhaps God forgot for a while and then it came back to his mind. <clears throat> no, it's just the Hebrew way of telling us that God never forgets his covenants with his people. And because God is truth itself and cannot lie, every covenant promise he makes is absolutely certain to be fulfilled by him. Often the fulfillments are done at times where it seems like the fulfillment is not even possible, certainly not likely. We think of Abraham and Sarah having a child in their senior years. You think of the kingdom of David continuing despite the unfaithfulness of the kings in the line of David. We could go on. All these examples we think, well, it doesn't look like it's happening. And then we see, no, it happened. He promised it would happen. It would happen. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he called the people to remember. Remember this attribute of God. In 1 Kings 8.56, Solomon says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. The author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11, 11 speaking of Sarah, for, by, for faith, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. You see that the relationship, again, between promises and truth and faithfulness are all tied together. Well, you know, how does that make you feel when you read verses like Romans, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1, 8, and 9? We read about God's faithfulness. We read, where are we, where we're told in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 
who will also confirm or keep you to the end, speaking of God, that you may be blameless the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. When you think of God's faithfulness, what does that mean when you read verses like Romans 8.28? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Despite the direst circumstances, the Christian can hold on to that unmovable rock of God's promises and you can ride out the storm. That's why Jeremiah, in the context of an enemy invasion, we can't even imagine that. Well, if you could try to imagine it, imagine troops coming down the streets and you're realizing it's now happened. We've lost it, the, uh, we've lost the battle, and now the enemy is approaching. Israel being overthrown by the uh, overthrown in the promised land by a pagan and vicious army. And Jeremiah writes these words, familiar to us from Lamentations 3. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. This is still Jeremiah. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Why? Because he's faithful. <clears throat> what about promises like Romans 38, 8, 38, and 39? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God will never leave you for another. He will fulfill his promises to you. <clears throat> well, how can we know that these words are true? Because God himself is truth. He cannot deny himself. He is essentially faithful. He cannot not be faithful. That's why I read in the psalmist when he writes in Psalm 118, 8 and 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Or in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Or Habakkuk, another prophet who witnesses the devastation that comes uh, in his nation as the people's unfaithfulness rises before God and he responds in judgment. Habakkuk writes, though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive tree may fail and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. The author of Hebrews voices the same thought. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, we see the connection between God's promises and his faithfulness. But we could go on and on about God's faithfulness and the implications for it, why we should trust him. But we're considering really the fruit of faithfulness in the believers this morning, the fruit of the Spirit. We just need to remember that faithfulness begins with God. He is perfectly faithful and true. He desires to produce that character in us. <clears throat> True spiritual faithfulness that is not something available to unsaved people. It's the work of God and those who put their faith in him. So let's talk about this fruit of the spirit in the life of the believer. Because we are made in the image of God, we are to image our creator in this attribute of faithfulness. This means that when we take our vows or when we covenant with God or others, we are to fulfill them. Even when it costs us something. For example, we read in Psalm 15, another psalm that's familiar to us. Psalm David, the psalmist David writes and asks the question, Who may abide in your tabernacle? Who, does, who can be in God's presence? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. There you go, the truth. He does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up reproach against a friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. 
He's made a commitment, and now he realizes the cost of that commitment, but he says, I made it, and I will follow through on it. Another word we can introduce into the conversation is the word integrity, which means undivided or whole. Your words match your deeds. David's words of walking uprightly in righteousness capture that idea. And we see a lot of examples of faithfulness in the Bible. Hebrews 11 is a catalog of men and women who are faithful. No, not perfect, but when the time came and the dust settled, they held on to God and his promises, and they faithfully trusted him, and they obeyed him. One great example of a man with this character quality, this fruit of the Spirit, is the prophet Daniel. You recall in Daniel 6, when Daniel was put in the authority, was put in authority in the halls of a pagan nation, and he, uh, he did, so, did so well in that position that the king planned to put him in charge of all the other authorities, and the other authorities resented him for it. So what did they do? They decided to set a trap for him. We read in Daniel 6.4, so the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find, uh, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor is there any error or fault found in him. Can you imagine that? I mean, you imagine anybody who's running for office now, what's the first thing the other side does? Dig up the trash. Let's find something in their past that we can use to throw against them and uh, make them discredit them in front of everybody else. Well, Daniel, they couldn't find anything. He was faithful. Integrity, faithfulness, truth, constancy, trustworthiness, these marked the prophet Daniel. And even when these pagan authorities tricked the king into issuing a decree that might result in Daniel's death, he stayed the course, even to the point of being thrown into a den of lions <clears throat> to be executed. Let me ask, does faithfulness describe you? Let's think this through a little bit and bring it home to our lives. Let's say put on your seatbelts, but maybe that's not a way to say it. But some diagnostic questions to ask. Would other people describe you as faithful? Are you the one who will lovingly confront a friend who is in error, for example? The Bible teaches in Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Would your friends describe you as faithful? Again, I'm not talking about being the Holy Spirit in people's lives and going around trying to find all their errors and faults. I'm just asking if you're willing to say the hard thing because you love them and you're faithful more than you want to keep peace or to be accepted. And you know, I didn't ask if you were faithful. I asked if others would describe you that way. We have a way of deceiving ourselves. If you find those around you would not describe you as trustworthy, and perhaps you have a faithfulness problem. Your deeds don't match your words. Another question, are you fulfilling the vows that you have made? Let's just think of the vows that you made before the elders of this church. Uh, to endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ. So let me ask, do you? I want to challenge the teens here, particularly because it's not hard to say the right words before the session, as intimidating as it might be to sit in front of 10 or 12 men. You can say the right words. You can memorize the formula. You can convince them that you know the doctrines of our faith. But you took a vow. And I want to encourage you to consider, are you endeavoring to live as becomes a follower of Christ? Or is that a mere string of words you spoke to please your parents? or to fulfill the ex expectations of the people around you? Is your personal integrity, your faithfulness to God, noteworthy to those around you? Are you ready to stand for Christ when it's not popular? By the way, it's not popular. Get outside the walls of this church, you'll find it's not popular. What I want to, don't want to just talk to the teens, I want to talk to all of us. Does faithfulness describe you? For those who are married, you've taken vows, perhaps vows such as these. By the grace of God, I blank take you blank to be my wedded husband or wife. I pledge to you my faithfulness to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, in plenty and in want, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to offer my strength 
that by God's grace and according to his holy plan, we might grow together into the likeness of Christ from this day forward as long as we both shall live. Are you fulfilling those vows? I want to say I am so thankful for a number of our couples in this church who have shown that faithfulness through incredibly hard times for multiple years. Thank you for your example. May we all follow that example. But are we fulfilling our vows? Not just with your body, but in your heart, in your mind, in your will, in your passions. Essentially note here that the wedding vows include potential circumstances that would test the vows in plenty and in want, in sickness and in health. And that's important because these questions remind us that your faith will be tested. In James 1, verses 2 through 8, we read about our faith being tested. Your faith or your faithfulness will be tested. James writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith or faithfulness produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That's a powerful text in relation to faithfulness. It tells us our faith will be tested. It doesn't say if you fall into trials, but when. It tells us what to do when our faith is tested and to start, we start to waver. We ask for wisdom. We note that it adds that we are to ask without doubting. It goes back to the very nature of faithfulness, doesn't it? It's marked by constancy, dependability. James adds that when people who doubt are like the sea that ebbs and flows, they are double-minded, described by one theologian as spiritually schizophrenic. On the subject of our faith being tested, we read multiple times in the Old Testament where God tests people's faithfulness. For example, Exodus 16, 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. Moses said to the people, Do not fear. God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember the Lord your God who led you all these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And judges, I also will no longer drive them out before them of any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them, that's through the enemies who are left in Israel, I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. I think C.S. Lewis captured this well. I'm going to read a paragraph by him. It's a little bit longer. From, uh, just uh, live with that. But uh, listen to the quote that Lewis gives describing the testing of our faith. But supposing a man's reason once decides that the weight of the evidence is for Christianity, that he becomes a Christian, I can tell that man what is going to happen to him in the next few weeks. There will come a moment when there is bad news or he is in trouble or he's living among a lot of other people who don't believe it and all at once his emotions will rise up and carry out a sort of blitz on his beliefs or else there will come a moment when he wants a woman or wants to tell a lie or feels very pleased with himself or sees a chance of making a little money in some way that's not perfectly fair. Some moment, in fact, at which it would be very convenient if his Christianity were not true. And once again, his wishes and desire will carry out a blitz. I'm not talking of any of moments at which any real reasons against Christianity will turn up. Those have to be faced in a different matter. I'm talking about moments, this is still Lewis, I'm talking about moments where a mere mood rises up against it. Now, faith in the sense with which I am here using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. For moods will change whatever your view your reason takes. End quote. Now, let me make clear. 
God's testing is not done because he doesn't know what is in the hearts of men and women. It's because he does know. And he's showing them that despite their proclamations of faith and faithfulness, they can often be self-deceived and continue in sin. Now, that's not the only reason that he tests our faith. Sometimes he tests our faith to toughen it, to condition it, to mold it, to strengthen it. But the tests will come. It's a part and parcel. It's a given in the Christian walk. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, wait, I've got a loophole. <clears throat> I just won't make any vows. I won't make any promises, and that way I won't end up breaking them. We've had the argument made at this church. We've had those who didn't want to take wedding vows. We've had those who didn't want to take membership vows. We've had those that don't want to take vows for infant baptisms. But if you do not take a vow, does that relieve you of all responsibilities if you're a professing Christian? I think that would be, actually, it's a misunderstanding of the purpose of vows. Vows are not meant to punish you or set you up for failure. They're designed to keep you from failing, to hold you to the commitments you've made, to hold you fast when the storms come, so that you remain faithful when you're tested. You remember the story of Odysseus and the sirens. If you remember, the sirens were the voices from the shore that would sing, and they would tempt the sailors to turn the boat to to go closer to the sirens, and when they do, they would be dashed to death on the rocks, their boats would be obliterated, and they would die. In the story, Odysseus wants to hear the songs, but he doesn't want to fall prey to them, so he had his men fill up their ears with wax, and and then he had them tie him to the, uh, the mast with ropes. One theologian described those ropes as being like vows, holding us to the mast when the storms rise. They keep us in our place. So for the Christian, vows are not your enemy. They're your friend to keep you on course when the trials come. How do we apply the passage? Well, I think we've already had several applications, but let me give a couple more in closing. Let's reflect again on the faithfulness of God to us. The psalmist and King David wrote about God's faithfulness over and over in the psalms, and there's one that I found very encouraging as I was Preparing the sermon, if you'd like, turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, David writes that believers are not to fret or be envious of unbelievers. He starts out with that idea. Don't be worried. Don't wish you were them. Kind of captures the two extremes. In Psalm 37, 1 through 5, we read this. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Feed on his faithfulness. What What a picture that is. The word feed here is sometimes translated graze. Look at the commands that follow. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to him. Trust also in him. This is uh, eradicating duplicity and double-mindedness in the Christian. It's a full force drive to a commitment. All these commands are uh, to stay faithful. We start by first feeding on his faithfulness and then committing ourselves to stay the course. And when we do, we find the fruit of the Spirit in us, making us faithful men and women, young men and women, even children who remain faithful and fruitful in their walk with Christ. Now, why should we do this? Why We could go to any number of passages, but let's, let's, let's use one more right in front of us, Psalm 37. What's the purpose of this? The psalmist says there are benefits for those who stay faithful in the Lord. Look at Psalm 37, 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Who's he describing here? Christians who hold firm to whom they serve, the ones who have fed on God's faithfulness, and they've overcome the tests of their faith. We read about these in Psalm, or I'm sorry, in Revelation 21, 7 and 8. He who, shall overcome, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But what does John say, the author, Apostle John? 
say about those who are not firm in their faith. And so, and so Revelation 21, verse 8, he describes a list of people, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, shall all have their part in the lake which burns with fire or brimstone, which is a second death. The word there that I want to point out, he says the cowardly, unbelieving. The word there for unbelieving is the same word as our Galatians 5.22, faithfulness, but for one letter. The letter A is in front of it. And if you don't know what that is, think of the difference between a, a theist and an atheist. Theist believes in God. Atheist is not a believer in God. It's the antithesis. So what's he describing here? One who is not faithful. Final note. As much as we find that we desire to be faithful, we know that often we fall short of the mark. That shouldn't surprise us, we have remaining sin. And we read in Proverbs 20, verse 6, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? And this reality can lead us to despair, knowing that we will not always be faithful to our Lord, or that we will fall short in our faithfulness to other people. What do we do about that? How do we address that reality that we still have that remaining sin and that we will not fulfill our vows completely. Once again, this is where we turn back to the Lord. We seek his help. Where is our hope in times when we fail in our faithfulness? One of the great promises of scripture is found in 1 John 1, 9. What do we read? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our ultimate hope then is not found in our perfect faithfulness to him, but his faithfulness to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your perfect faithfulness. And we recognize even in light of that how meager our faithfulness is and we would plead for the work of your spirit to produce that strength of trust of being persuaded of your truth so that we might live consistent lives of word and deeds that we might be those that others could put their trust in that we would be trustworthy father may that mark us as believers not as a means of salvation but as a picture of your grace and goodness and the work of your spirit in our lives For the glory of God, and we pray in his name. Amen. In closing, I ask you to please stand, and we'll sing together hymn number 245, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn 245.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.